Okay, so I managed, I don't know how I did, but let me see if I can get these up here. So the tips are still kind of rounded, um, but they're sharpened. So that's the ideal pencil tip right there for coloring on fabric. So hope that helps. Okay, so as before, I'm just going to hang tight um, and color, and then, um, um, then we'll talk at the end because then we'll do the B. And I'm gonna consider this project wrapped up. We'll talk a little bit about what to do here. Also, and what to do um, down here at the base as well. Now I'm just gonna come in and put in, again, you don't need any additional fabric medium. You can kind of use what you've got. I really wanna darken up the purple. Um, I really like this contrast. Um, and then we're gonna talk about what to do here because you can probably tell if you look close enough that I got a bit of purple color on there, no biggie. I'll show you how to fix that. Um, by the way, I mean, this is exactly what we would be doing in class if we, I was teaching this. So look at it this way. This is kind of a little freebie class. Um, really nothing here. And if you get outside like that, just scrub it away. That's the beauty about watercolor. I mean, it's, it's pretty easy to scrub it down. Inktense pencils aren't quite as easy to scrub down like this. Just put, deepen that color up. I really like this violet. Um, again, I, I choose violets for the most part because of their tendency to be towards the red family. And I don't know if anybody's been able to figure this out. If you haven't, let me inform you right now. Red, orange, yellow, uh, pinks, purples. Th these are my favorite colors. I'm, I'm not a big fan of blue. Um, I, 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 I hesitate using it because I'm usually not very good with it. Um, but boy, I can go to town with any of these colors on these flowers and, uh, feel comfortable with them. And I think we're all that way. I mean, I think that shows up too when we do our quilting. For those of you who are watching who are quilters, I know you know what I'm talking about. Um, and even in the art world, I think people tend to lean towards certain colors rather than others. So, wow, that looks really good. I'm very happy with that. Um, let me just smooth some of this out here. Okay, um, if doing this, you've got a bit of darker color down here, well, then that helps me make up my mind. If, at first, I was thinking maybe I would put orange down here or maybe even a little bit of that brown. You know what? I am. I am gonna use a bit of the brown because I'm going to assume that this is a pod, and this way I can use all the colors, or most of the colors that are in this box. 
So if you come along and put brown down, particularly with purple, it will completely disguise it. You don't need a lot. And then I like to do a light color of orange. There's a color in the Inktense Pencil Series called Baked Earth. It is my absolute all-time favorite color. And it looks like a combination of brown and orange. And again, just my personal preference. Doesn't have to be yours. Let me come back in really right here along where that purple is and kind of let's definitely put an outline around this, this whole bottom here. Darken it up all along the bottom as well. So see, this is, this is the beauty of watercolor. You can work it and work it and work it. Um, Inktense pencils aren't quite this forgiving. I mean, uh, I'm leaning towards actually, uh, the more I teach is starting people out with watercolor. Um, although most of you love the um, intensity of the color. Let's see what this looks like. Oh, there we go. Yeah, nice. Very nice. But I, I actually think watercolors are more forgiving. Um, no, they're not as intense in color. Um, but, but sometimes maybe that's that's a good way, a good thing to do. All right. Okay, so I've disguised it and turned it in as making it look like it's part of the flower. And we got a little bit of blending going on. All right, let's do a B, and then I'm going to consider this wrapped up. I'm, I'm just gonna tell you what I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna do just like what I did on these leaves. Uh, put a little bit of yellow in each one of these, cover it over with the darker green, and then blend. Um, sometimes I get little fanciful things going on there, but I don't think so this time. Now, let's talk about the B and the proper way to do this, and it gets me back to what I was describing out here. So here we have yellow and black. And, and in my mind, these are bumblebees. And, oh, before I do that, let me tell you what I would do with here in the wings. If we were doing this in class, many of you have taken a class with me where we've colored bees. There is a Jelly Roll Stardust pen clear. And all it does is it puts down sparkle. So I would probably color that in with a Jelly Roll. I'm sorry, wait, wait, I have one here. Nope, that's a, nope it is, nope, it's a yellow. Um, and I've got a silver and I don't wanna color it with silver. So, but this is what the Jelly Roll pen looks like. You can see the word Jelly Roll and instead of being this yellow, it would be clear. So that's what I would use on the wings to give it a bit of sparkle. In the meantime, here's what I'm going to do. And this is a six one way half dozen another. Do I do black first and then yellow? or yellow first and then black. Well, I'm gonna typically go with the light first, and I always consider the head black, so then I alternate. So the yellow will start here. And then this one. And this one. And then his little bee butt. So it'll be, but it's gonna be yellow. Okay, and I was pressing pretty hard there. And then grab your small brush, and grab my fabric medium, put my little bling covered parchment paper up there, and make sure this, you want very nice and clear yellow. So make sure your brush is nice and cleaned out. By the way, whenever you do that, make sure you dry the bristles really well on a paper towel. Otherwise you'll get bleeding and you'll cry. And I will tell you, I am so sorry. And then we'll have to use the boo-boo pen. I'm trying not to do that in this particular one. So far I've done a pretty good job. I don't have any major boo-boos that I would wanna cover up. Again, if you do, I have um, a whole video on using the boo-boo pen. Check it out. I try to break these things up. I mean, I know this is gonna be a long one, but I want you to consider this. That if you were taking this class, um, this is a four-hour class, by the way. Um, I'm getting ready to redo 
all of my classes for 2025, trying to come out with some new ones, of which this is one of them. And I'm trying to also create some half day, more half day classes because I know everybody's stretched thin right now. I know we're all counting every single dollar. And so if I can create some of these shorter, less expensive classes, but still give you some great information on how to coloring on fabric, that's the goal of a class like this. Okay, so there we go. Now, I know this isn't right, it's not 100% dry, but let's pretend it is for the moment. And here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna color very carefully with the black. Now, black, of course, is the strongest color out there, and it is a color. Um, it's in the spectrum. And I wanna color very, 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 very lightly. I, I don't wanna have a field day with the black, okay? So I'm not being super heavy handed with the black. I like this, I like this little one. There's, again, bees have seen, at least in the embroidery world, bees have become very popular lately, so. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy for that. The bees always make me happy. I've got a bunch of sage in my front yard, and when they it blooms, whoo-wee, the bumblebees come out, and the honeybees come out, and you can even hear them through a closed window. They're so loud around, around the the sage. Okay, now again, small brush. Be very careful. Just very lightly. You see, you don't need a lot. And just be very, very careful. Now, if you have trimmers, which I know some of you do, my suggestion would be is rather than using a pencil, go get yourself a permanent micron black pen to fill in the black, uh, or a Fabrico marker, or, you know, I've been talking lately about those cheap Chinese acrylic markers. You can use that. Um, something that you can control better than using a paintbrush and fabric medium. Okay, now, just because I can, I'm gonna pull back that yellow, and I am gonna put a little bit on its wing because I actually do wanna show y'all this. Um, so this is the yellow gel pen. Now you saw me flick my wrists. People ask me about gel pens all the time. I love gel pens but there is a downside to gel pens, y'all. They dry out. They get clogged up. I'm still carrying them and they're available for sale, but I'm making fewer and fewer kits with them because they have become a PETA. If you don't know what that is, it's a pain. You can kind of maybe fill in the rest of the blanks. <laughs> But it's costly too for me because a lot of times these things dry out before people have a chance to buy them and I have to throw the entire set away and that gets rather expensive. Well, now that's really cool. So I like that. And then what I would come along and do is with the clear is put the clear on the outside. So there's something um, you've just now learned how to use a jelly roll marker. So that's it in a nutshell. Now, what would I do next? I would let this dry overnight, 24 hours. Please, 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 please give it 24 hours to dry. 
Then the next morning I would get up and I would look at this and say, okay, do I need to put any more color here? Do I need to deepen the green some more? You know, you can still, as I said earlier, you can add up to three additional layers of color before the fabric is not going to be able to absorb any more fabric medium. If I'm happy and once I'm happy, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it over to my iron and guess what? I have an iron right here behind me so I can actually pretend that I'm doing this. And I'm going to set all my other stuff aside and give you guys a quick lesson in ironing because I truly do believe this is a very, very critical step and I don't want you to miss it. So let's pretend that instead of the foam board, I have my ironing board down here. I have one around here someplace, but it's not. Oh yes, it is. It's very easily accessible. Hang on a second. I'm gonna grab my ironing board because I want you to, to see this all the way in person. And I have this tiny little ironing board that I keep handy whenever I'm doing bling. Okay, there we go. So there's my ironing board. Let me just check to see. All right, let me get this in the picture there. There's my ironing board. Here's my iron. No, it's not on, okay, because I'm not finished with this. Now you could iron and still continue to color, okay? So don't think that once you iron it, you can't go back in and color again. Yes, you can. Um, in some instances, that actually might be preferable, um, but I can't recall why, but, but you could do it. So, so don't think you can't. All right. Now it's the next day. This thing is completely dry and I've completely covered it. I'm going to tell you what I do. The very first thing I do is number one, I grab paper towels and I put it down on my ironing board. Now, why do I do that? Um, you can't tell, but this ironing board has got all sorts of stuff spilled all over it. And I don't wanna run the risk of that getting on my fabric. So the very first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put down a, a section of paper towels. Then, and then I put my work down. Now, since I'm working from the back, I don't use a press cloth. And there's an argument to be made that I could scorch the fabric just as easily from the back as I could from the front, except I still have the tearaway on here. The tearaway is acting as my press cloth, okay? So now my iron is hot. It's at the cotton setting, no steam. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to come here and I'm gonna press firmly and I'm gonna to count to 10. Then I'm gonna left and come down again and I'm overlapping, count to 10. And I'm gonna to continue to do that all across my work until I feel like it's 100% ironed from the back. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip it over. Now I will get a press cloth. And back to the parchment paper. And normally I wouldn't have the bling on there, but anyway, it, it is and it doesn't matter because it's not going to affect the work underneath there. Now, the reason I like parchment paper is for obvious reasons. I can see my work. And I'm just gonna repeat the same process that I did on the flip side. And once again, hold 10 seconds, lift, down, hold 10 seconds, lift, and overlap, moving the parchment paper with me and continuing to overlap until it's completely done. And that, as they say, is that. Your work would now be finished. Um, you could now go ahead and wash it, put it into whatever quilt you're gonna be making. And let me address one other thing too. At this point in time, after it's all been heat set, I would consider coming along and tearing the excess away from the outside, just as I'm doing right now. I have become kind of a big proponent of this because I hear too many people talking about how stiff this makes. Well, you can't take it out from inside the pattern. You will distort the stitching. But if you take it from away from around here as best you can, you'll really give yourself more flexibility in attaching this to sashing or attaching it to another block or whatever you're going to do with it 
it just gives it, it, it allows you some more flexibility and it doesn't make it so um, stiff but I will tell you that the particular stabilizer that I use after you've washed it a couple of times it becomes it feels like fabric you can you can you can't feel it um, come by the booth one of these days grab my cat or my dog quilt in fact, I just washed the cat quilt yesterday. It's getting softer and softer every single time I wash it. And it comes out looking exactly like it did when I first colored it. So there you go, that's it. There you have had an entire class, a beginner class, start to finish. Um, hopefully you got something from this. Okay, I am going to do the thing I said I wasn't going to do because I see a little boo-boo and I can show you this real quick. All right, I have a tiny bit of red right there. My boo-boo pen, if I haven't told you already, is just basic whiteout pens. And you saw me shake it up a bit. Now there's usually gunk at the end of the tip. I'm gonna take that away. Now you, you need to make sure this is dry, and this is why I hesitate showing people. Um, and, and by the way, I'm testing off, off camera to make sure I've got ink coming out. The reason I don't provide these in class, the reason I don't like showing people this is because inevitably people forget the one critical step, which is you got to wait until your boo-boo is completely dry before you do this. If you put this down while the boo-boo is still wet, you are just going to make your mistake that much worse. It will cause the color to spread. But all I'm doing is I'm coming in and I'm squeezing and pressing all at the same time, make sure the tip is almost straight up and down. And I don't know if you can see that, but I just covered up a little bit of the red. Um, there's a tiny bit of green over here. I'll cover that up as well. And that's it. But please, 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 if you're gonna use this, please wait until <clears throat> it's completely dry. All right, there you go. That's the complete class. Again, if you have any questions, or you can't understand something that I did here today, please leave a note in the comments below and I'll be more than happy to respond. And as always, thank you so much for watching. Take care.